Hello, everybody. I'm Casper. And I'm David. And this is episode three of Let's Talk About Sweat. Uh, David and I just had an incredible conversation with Drew Best. Uh, He's a researcher at University of Massachusetts studying the evolution of sweating in humans. And he is incredible at explaining it. so good. So we are excited for you guys to hear uh, this episode. But first, let's, uh, let's listen to this week's embarrassing sweat story. It's, uh, it's from Jess, who is one of our coworkers at Carpe. Okay, so my most embarrassing sweat story, stinky shoes. So I lived with my boyfriend at the time, and I had a few pairs of flats that I wore to work every day. I remember that morning I got dressed, and I was putting on my shoes, and I was thinking, ew, these shoes really stink. Do other people actually smell this too? Um, anyway, I was feeling so frustrated and embarrassed and thinking, am I the only one that has stinky shoes because of gross feet? I went to work, I came home that day, and I took off my shoes, not really thinking about how they were actually going to smell, and my boyfriend was disgusted. He was immediately blurting out, oh my God, what does that smell, your shoes? I was mortified. I ended up throwing them away that night and buying a new pair online, just feeling hopeless. Like, am I going to have to buy a new pair of shoes every six months? There's got to be something to prevent this. So that was my most embarrassing sweat story. So fortunately, uh, Jess discovered Carpe Foot antiperspirant, and it was a huge help, and she actually ended up joining the Carpe team. She is probably that product's biggest fan on our team. Thank you so much, Jess, for sharing that story. If any of y'all want to share your story on the podcast, please send it to my story at mycarpe.com. But for now, let's talk about sweat. Hey everybody, I'm Casper. And I'm David. And we were two sweaty guys who started Carpe. We met in college, we connected over our sweaty hands, and we've spent the past few years thinking about sweat, researching sweat, and working on sweat solutions. So join us each week and let's talk about sweat. Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Talk About Sweat. Today our guest is Andrew Best, who is a PhD candidate in biological anthropology at the University of Massachusetts. He is basing his thesis all about the evolution of sweat in in humans. Did I get that more or less correctly? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You you wanna put it in uh, your own words, Andrew? Sure, sure. So that's that's my more general interest is how did sweating evolve in in humans? Um, My uh, dissertation is is more narrow than that. And so we're looking at uh, what is the diversity in, in sweat gland number across living humans? So what is the variation between you and me and what causes it? So what led you to dive into the, the evolution of the sweat gland and the diversity of the, the number, the density of sweat glands among people? What um, led you there? Two things, uh, floundering and serendipity, right? <laughs> so when I went back to grad school, um, I had a pretty honed focus. I knew that I wanted to do something regarding the evolution of human running. And so that's kind of what I started with in grad school when I got my master's. Um, And then, as you may know, when you're getting a PhD, you have to really hone in on something very specific. It has to be a question that's testable, uh, feasible to test, and that no one else has answered yet. And if you can't figure that out, then you can't even try to get a PhD, right? So I spent a year or two kind of floundering, like, okay, what are my questions going to be? And I settled on something involving heat and getting rid of heat. Um, You know, I'm not the first one to recognize this, but uh, I realized that um, getting rid of heat was a really important step in human evolution, a really important uh, challenge we had to overcome. So um, I ended up having a meeting with one of my science heroes, uh, Dr. Dan Lieberman from from Harvard. and he's like the evolution of running guy. You know, he's, he's a, a, a world expert on that topic and actually lots of topics when it comes to human evolution. So I got to meet him and now he's on my committee and he basically, um, that's awesome. He, he basically ultimately gave me the question. I said, here are my interests. They're inspired by you. Um, and he said, okay, here is something I've wanted to test. And, uh, if you can figure out how to do it, do it. So ultimately he gave me a question. And I'm going for it. That's that's excellent. So you started with this interest in running, and that kind of lead you to the idea of, um, and I think we'll get into this a bit. One of the reasons that humans are such good runners is because we can dissipate heat so well, right? And that comes from sweating. Yeah. Wow. So I'm guessing you're a runner yourself. Yes. Awesome. So like half marathons, marathons, or long distance, your sprinter. 
Um, I did all the road stuff in my 20s. And I mean, you know, I'm in my late 30s now and I've transitioned into trail and mountain running and also a lot of mountain biking. So now it's all in the woods. So I'm slower but stronger. That's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> Love it. So we were talking a bit about this before we started recording. Um, you know, in your late 30s, you're, you're coming into this uh, whole PhD thing a little later than most. What brought you back into academia? What were you doing before? Um, teaching high school biology, which I still do. Um, I've been doing that um, for 14 years. And I was developing a unit on human evolution to present to my high school kids. Um, you know, quick tangent, quick little like PSA here. Most states do not have human evolution in the science standards. So a lot of kids don't hear anything about it or hear very little about it, wow. um, which I think is a travesty. And we could go down a rabbit hole as to why that is, but we won't. Um, so I got passionate about that and I didn't know much about it. So in uh, developing this unit, I was learning the basics of human evolution to teach it, you know, to my kids. And I uh, came across a paper um, called Endurance Running and the Evolution of Homo by uh, Dennis Bramble and Dan Lieberman. Um, and it basically argued, hey, look, uh, one of the reasons why we look and function the way we do is because our ancestors were, were running. And at some point it was part of our survival. So that really lit a fire, you know, for me. Yeah. Um, and I realized, oh, there's all these really interesting um, pieces of human evolution that are relevant to me that people haven't figured out, right? I was like, there's actually a space for me to go try to become a scientist and do what I love. So that's, that's the, the whole story. That's incredible. So, all right. So you meet with your hero, you figure out this idea of, hey, I'm going to research sweating and how uh, it evolved in humans to allow us to dissipate heat very efficiently. And that allowed us to, you know, be really good runners. So let's get into that. What, what have you found? What have you been discovering about how sweating really started out in humans and how that changed humans as a species? Well, I guess I'll first give the disclaimer that I haven't done any direct research um, on the question of early human sweating. So what I've discovered has mostly been cobbled together from work other people have done. Basically, um, let's see, there's, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but so the story of um, human sweating, I guess, really starts, I almost want to pull up some notes for myself. Now, I'll just do it from memory. <laughs> <laughs> no rush, you can, can pull up notes if you want. <laughs> All right, so, so we are primates, right? So our, our closest living relatives are apes and monkeys. Actually, we can back this all the way up. So 200 million years ago or so, with some, some very early mammals, um, sweat glands developed on the hands and feet. Wow. So hands and feet were the first place sweat glands ever came about. Yeah. So the kind of sweat glands that, that cover your body, they're called the uh, eccrine sweat glands. Uh, those are different from the ones in your armpits and groin, um, which are called African sweat glands. And in us, those aren't used for cooling. They actually like produce oils and scents and other, they have other jobs. But for the kind of sweat glands we're talking about, yeah, they show up on the hands and feet first in, in mammals. And we think that they're used for frictional gripping. So like, think about when your hands and feet sweat. It's when you're nervous, as you guys know, right? Right. So it's emotional sweating. Um, and in, in mammals that may function to in, in that fight or flight moment of like run for your life gives you a little bit more traction. Mm. That's, that's why we think um, those glands on your hands and feet are, are activated by, by the fight or flight response by, by fear. Right. We still have that as you guys know. So that's a very primitive mammal trait, but we still have it. So the sweat glands on our hands and feet do sweat when we're nervous. Um, but in in one group of primates called the catarines, these are apes and monkeys who evolved in Africa, mm, I don't know, 20 plus million years ago, uh, probably actually 40 million years ago, something like that. I'm probably getting the number wrong. Um, for some reason, sweat glands spread to the body surface. So they spread not just from the fingers and toes, but to the general skin um, where they could be used for cooling. Because it turns out, um, this is kind of like a pre-adaptation where there's, where there's a structure that has one purpose but then it can take on another purpose because it's already kind of suited for it, right? So sweat glands on your general body surface, as they, um, as they uh, you know, secrete sweat onto the skin surface, that hot skin drives evaporation of the sweat, taking the heat with it. So the blood in your skin gets cooled by the sweat evaporating. So that, that, that worked for them. And so this group of primates closely related to us um, can sweat to cool, and they still do 
We're not quite sure how good they are at it. Um, pause me if you have any questions during this brief. No, this is you know, great. This is incredible. I just want to make sure we're understanding. So uh, it, it seems like based on, you know, the, what is it, a fossil record that we're looking at or how are we determining these things? What, how is the scientific community? That is, a, that is a great question. So when we're trying to reconstruct the story of how sweating evolved, we can't use fossils because you know, the relevant structures like sweat glands, hair follicles, they don't fossilize. Um, so we don't have direct evidence of that. So some of the best things we can do are comparative studies of living primates, right? So we say, all right, here are the primates we're most closely related to. They're like our evolutionary cousins. Um, what kind of sweating traits do they have? And then we can work backwards and we can do some analyses and say, okay, here's when we think these traits evolved um, and here's why. Wow. So based on this record of, of kind of living comparable primates, uh, we think that sweating actually started in the hands and feet for, you know, this kind of emo what we today call emotional sweating. Fight or flight response. The fight or flight response. That's how it started. And then almost by some kind of accident, it started spreading across the body surface of a type of primate, you know, a type of monkey in a sense. And that happened to help it cool, which I guess evolution selected for because then it had better thermal dissipation. Is that basically the leading theory right now? Yeah, you are spot on. So that's, that's the point in the story that we just got to. And that was a great summary. But we're not done because um, those primates can sweat to cool, but not super well, at least we don't think. But when it comes to apes, so apes are our closest, closest primate relatives, right? Chimpanzees, gorillas, um, they, um, they didn't actually develop really any more sweat glands, you know, than these, these earlier primates, but their, their body hair um, got a lot thinner and they actually lost a lot of body hair, right? So with apes, we see this shift to what was probably better sweating. So apes, we think, can sweat better than these other um, sort of earlier primates and these other catarine primates. So with apes, we have this, this other shift, which is the hair reduction, right? And then in humans, somewhere in the human lineage, we have this huge increase in sweat gland density. So apes are decent sweaters, but somewhere in human evolution in the last three to six million years, uh, we have a tenfold increase in sweat gland density. So per unit area, you've got 10 times more sweat glands than an ape. That's huge. Wow. Yeah. And, and so, why does the reduction in uh, hair follicles lead to increased sweating? Um, well, for one thing, because less hair means more efficient sweating. So sweat can evaporate better when you're not wearing clothing, say, or when you're not totally covered in hair. Right. And the other reason probably is that um, there seem to be some genetic correlations between, or inverse correlations between hair follicle density and sweat gland density. So when you have less hair follicles, you can also have more sweat glands. So it creates the conditions where sweating is more effective, less hair. And well, you've got more space in your skin too to make more sweat glands. Um, so those two things really do go hand in hand. That makes sense. So where really was it in the human lineage that, um, you know, we had this explosion of sweat gland density? Was it Homo sapiens or was it a bit before that? So probably before that, um, my best guess is it probably was somewhere between two and three million years ago. So one of the questions here is um, when did we start to lose body hair, like really start to lose body hair? Because when that happened, that's probably co-evolving with increased sweating, right? So it could have been with an ancestors called Australopithecus. These are um, early early human ancestors who lived three to four million years ago in Africa, and they walked upright. And from the waist down, they were pretty efficient at walking upright. But one of the remaining questions is, how much were they walking? If they were foraging for food in the middle of the day um, to avoid predators, which makes sense because they had no defenses, and we know they got eaten by predators, then there would have been a selective pressure for them to evolve much better sweating. Now, uh, whether that was through just uh, gland level adaptations, so we found um, primates living today in hot, dry climates, they don't have any more, any more sweat glands than other primates, but their individual glands have more fuel and have more blood vessels feeding them, uh, which would suggest um, that they've evolved uh, in response to the local climate. So all of which is to say, sweating could have first really taken off with Australopithecus three million years ago um, if they were walking a lot. And again, we're not 
really sure how much they were walking, what their daily travel distance was. But more likely, it took off with Homo erectus, who is the long distance walker and maybe runner. And this is one of our direct ancestors. They show up uh, around 2 million years ago. And from the neck down, they look like us, right? They have shorter arms, longer legs, all the bipedal adaptations we have, you know, for walking and running efficiently. So that's the long answer. Two to three million years ago is when I think um, sweating really takes off. And part of that is based on climate and lifestyle. So especially with our genus, genus Homo, there is good evidence that we're eating more meat and that we're in a, in a drier, more open environment. So the forest in Africa is starting to disappear and become more like savanna, like it is in East and South Africa today, right? Um, and in that climate, you need to walk farther to find food. Food is more widely dispersed. Um, and so then there's an evolutionary pressure for, you know, walking, maybe running longer distances, and that generates huge amounts of heat. And so then you really have to cool. So the human strategy of walking farther to find food, maybe running down prey, um, that requires cooling. And so these things that made us human, this, this lifestyle shift, which leads to bigger brains and all the rest, um, is dependent on, well, many things, but one of them is sweating. Wow. So tell us more about this scene basically on the African savanna, right? Because this is where you're saying this really evolved across these two possible species um, where you mentioned earlier on potentially being out in the middle of the day. Why did being out in the middle of the day confer an evolutionary pressure or what's the term you used? What's like the correct term for... You're close. I mean, it, it, it presented a selective pressure. Selective pressure. Okay. So why did it present a selective pressure to be out in the middle of the day versus, you know, when it's cooler? Um, so most, most predators, really most animals don't really have a great way to cool off. Well, at least if they're generating lots of metabolic heat, like through being really physically active and it's a hot environment, they don't have great ways to cool off, right? They can pant and panting works. Um, but you can't run for a while and pant at the same time. So, which is to say most predators aren't very active in the middle of the day in a really hot environment, right? So actually most animals period aren't active when it's really hot. Um, you know, they like to, they're nocturnal or they're crepuscular, right? So like, um, evenings and mornings. So for a defenseless, uh, Australopithecine, you know, like a three and a half foot tall, uh, early human, they didn't have any defenses, and so it would have made sense to, to be using the middle of the day as a, as a safer time to be finding food. Um, and if they did that, they would have had to have a better way of cooling off, right? So there would have been an evolutionary pressure um, favoring any adaptations that, that help them cool just a little bit better as they were doing that. So it's just like a classic story of natural selection, we think. Right. So you mentioned that, uh a bigger brain would also demand more cooling. Why is that? Um, well, so, so the brain is a very hungry organ, right? It, it consumes a lot of calories and therefore it uh, generates a lot of heat. And it also really needs to be kept cool. So you do have some adaptations in like your blood vessels and your neck and stuff to, to you know, uh, basically there are, there are dedicated mechanisms for just keeping your brain cool. Um, so, and a bigger brain would really just compound that issue. Um, so being really physically active with a bigger brain, I guess, just makes that challenge harder. Uh, so does that mean s sweatier? Does that mean sweatier people are smarter? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm really sweaty, so I hope so. <laughs> and then one other question that kind of follows from that. Um, so obviously, dogs still pant, right, to to cool down. Why did they not evolve in a similar way? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, okay, so to answer that, we can look at an example of other animals who have come up with a similar solution as, as humans, right? So um, horses, camels, and sheep, that, that group of, of ungulate animals, they are among the only other animal group that has evolved sweating to cool. And as is often the case with, with convergent evolution, where you have a different starting point and you arrive at a different, at a different uh, solution you know, to the same problem, they didn't recruit uh, eccrine glands from the hands and fingers for that. They're using the apocrine sweat glands. Oh, wow. So 
those spread to the body surface in those animals, and there they function much like our eccrine glands do. So they've evolved for cooling. So humans aren't the only animals that have seen this evolutionary path. Um, so back to your question, why don't more animals do it like dogs? I mean, I guess just like any other evolutionary trait, um, all the right pieces have to be in place for something to evolve, right? So, you know, dogs, um, I believe most dogs, maybe the, there's probably exceptions like the African hunting dog or something. Most of them don't, don't do hunting in the middle of the day when it's really hot. Um, they're covered in fur, so sweating wouldn't work very well anyway. Um, I think it probably has more to do with climate. Yeah. Would be my guess. But I mean, it's kind of like brain size. If, you know, uh, we could ask, why don't more animals have really big brains? Well, because all it's all the all the conditions have to be in place to, you know, make a trait like that worthwhile and to even make it happen. This is this is incredible. OK, so so we talked a bit about how uh, potentially there was the selective pressure from humans wanting to hide from prey. But what about when humans were the predators and they were actually starting to hunt animals on these savannas? Yeah. So again, it's really unfortunate that some of the direct evidence that we could have doesn't actually fossilize, right? So if we want to ask the question, um, how were humans, say, two million years ago, like Homo erectus, our genus, how were we getting food? We can look at things like, okay, when, are the, when do we find the earliest evidence of, of weapons, right? And two million years ago, we don't see any evidence for like long-range spears and stuff. So early humans at that point were probably not hunting with the kind of like projectile weapons that uh, hunter gatherers do now. And even later, you know, like uh, Neanderthals developed and you know, uh, Homo sapiens developed. Yeah. So, but we do find evidence that they are cutting meat off of bones, right? So we find bones of ungulates and other African mammals that have been cut up with stone tools. Now they could have been scavenging, right? So for much of early human history, scavenging was almost certainly a big part of how we got meat. So like run to a carcass and scare off the competition and try to eat what you can. And that, that also may have involved running. So walking and running and you know, dumping heat as you're doing that uh, would be one reason why we had to evolve to become even better sweaters. But it's also likely that um, early humans were actually running down their prey. So this is called the persistence hunting hypothesis. And the hypothesis part of it is the idea that we did this two million years ago, but the persistence hunt itself is, is observable fact, right? So there are some, um, some hunter gatherer groups who still occasionally do this. Um, you can Google this um, human mammal, human hunter. It's a David Attenborough clip from uh, 2006. Um, and you can see that um, basically over the course of several hours, maybe many hours, uh, what, what these people do is track an animal and not let it cool off in the shade, right? So most animals have adapted to sprinting away from what's trying to eat them and then rest in the shade. But a human can sort of track them, walk, jog, run after them for hours, flushing them out of the shade, and it drives them to heat stroke. And at that point, you can walk up to the animal and kill it with a rock. And this does happen sometimes. So it's been demonstrated that this is possible. Um, and that's due entirely to humans being able to walk and run in the heat, which other animals aren't very good at. Wow. And also tracking. Tracking ability is huge. Like, I'm a decent runner. I could not go do this. You have to be a really good tracker. So there's cognition involved here, too. So, so tracking in the sense of being able to figure out where the animal went. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, and you know, like you're saying, this is a hypothesis as to whether this was happening so long ago, but it's observable fact that it's happening right now with certain groups. Uh, hypothesis is humans got bigger brains, were able to get smarter at uh, figuring out where animals were going. Uh, they were able to survive in the heat longer so we could just keep running behind these animals. And those two things together both required more sweating. Yeah, yeah, well put. So uh, what's the next stage that you're really looking at in the evolution of the density of the sweat glands and how they evolved over time? Great question. So there's a lot of questions that remain. I mean, all the stuff that I've been talking about is um, it's all hypothesized and these are difficult hypotheses to test. They're not untestable, but these are, you know, these, some of these ideas have only been around a few years and some of them have been around for a hundred years, but all of them are still 
fairly untested, right? So we still have a lot of questions about the early evolution of uh, human sweating, but we also have questions about whether sweating has continued to evolve in more modern humans, right? So when our ancestors left Africa um, 50 to 100,000 years ago, I forget what, what the number is now, um, we moved into novel habitats, right? And so maybe there was an evolutionary pressure um, changing our sweat gland biology when we moved into these new habitats. Um, that's possible. And so one thing that I'm testing is, so basically we are getting people, it's all, it's mostly UMass students, but we have people from all over the world. So we're getting as many people as we can and we're counting their sweat glands. And we're giving them a uh, genetic ancestry test kit yeah. and we're trying to correlate, see, okay, um, does your recent ancestry, uh, does it correlate at all with how many sweat glands you have? So that's our way of, of getting at whether evolution has shaped sweat gland density outside of Africa. Wow. And how are you counting? Yeah, how do you sweat do this? Glands? Sorry, go ahead. How are you counting the individual sweat glands? Yeah, so um, we use a drug. It's called uh, pilocarpine nitrate, and it mimics a neurotransmitter. So we, um, I know most people won't be watching the video, but I'll show you. So we're testing six body areas, and the first one is the inner forearm. So we put this little drug disc on your skin. And we use electricity to drive the drug into your skin, just in an area maybe the size of a quarter or a half dollar. And what that drug does is it, it travels down your sweat pores and it makes every sweat gland think that the brain is yelling at them and that the brain wants them to sweat. So this is a way of, of ensuring that every, every sweat gland in the test area is actually sweating. Um, just putting you in a hot room, you wouldn't necessarily recruit all your sweat glands. So once the person is sweating, in each area, um, I use a silicone material and I make an impression of that area of skin so that when the sweat droplets come out of the pores, they make holes in the impression material. And it's the holes that I count. So we wow. scan it with the scanner. Uh, we use computer software to modify the image a bit so the holes show up as black dots. And then we have the computer count the holes. And it seems to be about 95% uh, precise, oh. meaning when we, when we do uh, when we repeat this test in the same area several times, it's, it's about a 5% error. So it's a pretty good method. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Wow. So how many sweat glands are there in that quarter size on the forearm? Uh, it's a, so there's a lot of variation between people, obviously. Um, and it, it actually depends a lot on how much skin you have. So the bigger a person is, the lower their sweat gland density because their sweat glands are more spread out, which is a whole thing. Like, it, it's it's almost like you're born with a certain number of sweat glands, regardless of how big you're going to be. And then if, as if you grow into a bigger person, um, you have a lower sweat gland density, but uh, roughly 90 per square centimeter. So if, you know, generally speaking, everyone's born with a similar number of sweat glands. Why is it that some people are sweating a lot more than others? Okay, well, I should first back up and say we're not really sure that people are born with the same number of sweat glands. What I, what I, mean, to, what I mean to say is um, it, we know that body surface area has a huge effect, is, is highly predictive of how many sweat glands you have. We're not entirely sure why that is. But So then why do some people sweat more than others? Um, I actually think you guys probably know more about this than I do, but one thing that I can add is that um, there's a lot of variation between people in sweat response. So even when I give people this, this drug, some people sweat a lot and some people hardly sweat at all, right? Wow. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. So first of all, uh, regardless of how many sweat glands you have, I mean, um, me and my best friend actually are both in the study. And we have, I think, two of the lowest sweat gland densities out of anybody in the study. And we are the two sweatiest people. <laughs> Interesting. Drug. And the other phase of the study, we have um, people on, on, a, uh, on a bike in a uh, metabolic chamber where we can measure energy uh, usage, heat production, and we're seeing if how many sweat glands you have actually explains how well you get rid of heat. So we're, we're asking whether sweat gland density matters. That's a whole other thing. But we're, we're also the sweatiest people there. So all of which is to say, you can have very few sweat glands and just have a prodigious sweat output per gland. So it's clearly not all about how many glands you have. Um, it's things like your current acclimation status. So if you spend a lot of time in the heat or you're exercising a lot in the heat, especially like in the summer, you will start to sweat more. That's one of your body's responses for cooling. But if you grow up in a hot climate, 
regardless of your genetic background, if you're raised in a hot climate from, from childhood, you have an attenuated sweat response generally, and you actually, it actually takes a little bit more to make you sweat. So there's this really complicated um, process that determines, you know, who sweats more than others. And of course, there's also the disorders of sweat, you know, which right. you talk about. Um, so, so that latter point, um, I read in one of your papers, you referenced uh, someone named Kuno, who was talking about like phenotypic plasti uh, plasticity and how you can have active and inactive sweat glands. Um, his hypothesis, if I understand, stood it correctly, was that climate really has a large impact on the number of active and inactive sweat glands. So is that in line with the latter point that you're making in terms of if you're born in a warmer climate, it's possible that you have a higher number of active sweat glands, therefore you are going to sweat more even if you're in a cold place? Matt. I'm impressed with how you guys read that that paper of mine because you're asking all the right questions. It's a good I, paper. Got, yeah, that is that is the the first of the three questions I'm testing. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the so phenotypic plasticity, you know, for anyone listening, basically says regardless of your genetics, um, everything about your environment will help determine what your biology ends up being. So example, um, if I start lifting a lot of weights with my right arm, my right arm gets bigger you know, the, the genes in my right arm are the same as in my left arm, but different environment, different result. Okay. So yeah, we are testing Kuno's idea that if you're, if you grow up in a hot climate, maybe you use more of your sweat glands um, and therefore they, they stay active for life. So there's a couple parts to this. Um, most of this is kind of conjecture at this point which is why I'm testing it. But we do know that you are born with your total number of sweat glands, right? but they're not fully mature. So in the first, I mean, with humans, we're not sure. It might be weeks, months, even years of life. Um, those sweat glands have to flip over and they're actually controlled by a different type of neurotransmitter chemical, right? Really? And that's what's mature. So it's that, that presents the possibility then that maybe using more of your sweat glands as a baby or as a little kid might lead to more of those glands becoming mature and therefore as an adult you have more functional sweat glands so that's it's totally reasonable it makes sense um and so that's why we're testing it but kuno thought that he found evidence for it so he's a, a japanese researcher from the 40s and 50s he did some very preliminary he did a lot of sweat work but um uh, i think he was a little overconfident with his idea there because he, he didn't really test it and a, a few people have kind of looked at it but uh, the evidence so far is very inconclusive. Okay. And when we're talking about sweat gland density, are you talking about, um, or, or sorry, this phenotypic plasticity, is it just relating to the sweat glands primarily used for thermoregulatory sweat, like on the forearm? Yeah. So they uh, cover your whole body. Um, so, you know, we're talking about basically the, the uh, density of your eccrine sweat glands everywhere, but everywhere, everywhere, but your toes and fingers, which, and, and I am looking at that too, but that because those are controlled by a different part of the nervous system, they may not be subject to the same um, process. That's another question we have. Does the number of sweat glands in your fingertip actually correlate with how many are on the rest of your body? I hope to have an answer to that in the next month or so. Um, well, a preliminary answer. Um, you said that the system, the nervous system that the controls the uh, fingers and toes is different uh, than what controls, say, like, the actual palms or right. So are you uh, saying armpits. like it's different between the fingers and the palms, or it's different between the hands and the forearm? That I'm not sure. Um, certainly between the fingers and the rest of the body, right? So you will still sweat from from your fingers when you're hot. So they do still function in uh, thermal sweating, but they're but they're also controlled by you know by this like fight or flight response part of your brain, and the rest of your sweat glands are not. Okay. So you're sort of looking at the fight or flight activated sweat glands a little separately from just the thermoregulatory activated sweat glands. Exactly, exactly. And that's actually fairly easy to test. So um, you can actually see, well, I mean, if you had a microscope, you could see the sweat pores on your fingertip ridges. And anyone could Google this, just type uh, sweat glands fingertips, and you get some pretty cool pictures. The pores are big enough that they're visible on the, on the ridges of your fingertips. So I'm making impressions of those. And I haven't analyzed them yet, but I'm hoping I can see, I guess it'll actually be convex structures showing where the pores were on the rest of your body pores are not visible they are closed unless they're actively sweating 
So you can't just count pores. You have to wait for the sweat gland to sweat to figure out where they are. But on your fingertips, yeah, you can totally see them. Uh, and so we think, well, we don't really know whether the density on your fingertips is connected with the density on the rest of your body. I feel like they have to be, but we don't know how much. Awesome. So I, I know that um, reducing sweating isn't a part of your research. However, would you, based on what you know, would you have any hypotheses as to why it would be harder to reduce sweat on your palms and soles versus, say, your underarms? Oh, interesting. I would be harder. So I guess, um, what are the treatment modalities for reducing sweating in your armpits? Is it is it always a topical application like a deodorant antiperspirant? Yeah, so say say you apply an antiperspirant to your underarms and you apply that same uh, topical to your hands and feet. Based on you know other research, hands the hands and feet are harder to actually reduce the sweat. You're not going to get as much efficacy. Um, any thoughts as to why that would be? Interesting. Um, so I believe the sweat glands in your armpits, so you have both eccrine and apocrine sweat glands in your armpits. And I believe the eccrine ones um, are also part of the fight or flight response. I believe it's part of emotional sweating. Um, but maybe your hands and feet are harder to stop the sweating only because you have a much higher sweat gland density there. So actually the density on your fingers and toes and hands and feet is higher than anywhere else in the body. So maybe it's just there are more glands putting out sweat. And so it's harder to harder to stop. Great. Okay. So uh, you talked amazingly about the evolution of the thermoregulatory type of sweating. What about the emotional sweating? You mentioned it kind of came up uh, 200 million years ago. Is, is that how far back it potentially came from? That's, that's, that's a number that I made up for a, a recent talk that I gave. Um, I'm not sure anyone really knows, but since I, I believe all, I mean, almost all mammals have it, it's a primitive mammal trait to have these glands on your hands and feet. So it must date back to some pretty early mammals, or at least like one of the last common ancestors for all mammals that live today. So yeah, I would say around 200 million years ago is a decent number. Um, you know, someone out there can feel free to correct me. Um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's a very ancient trait. Have you seen any, um, is, is there any evidence suggesting that that trait's evolved in any way over the last 200 million years, like changed? That's a great question. I, you know, every time that I talk to someone about my project, you guys ask me questions that I like really want to write down. I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to write them down. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be t too surprised if there's been some evolutionary change. Um, but the fact that so many mammals still have it and that humans still have it, even though, I mean, we have lots of traits that are no longer very helpful in the world we live in, right? I mean, being nervous before a test so that your pencil is slippery. That's not helping you. Um, I mean, and the fact that we wear shoes and stuff, like uh, having extra grip on your toes when you're nervous is not going to help you run for your life, right? So we have all these traits that were useful in the past that we still have because they just haven't gone away. Um, but it's, it seems to be highly conserved, right? Meaning it, so many animals still have it um, for whatever reason, maybe because of its uh, genetic underpinnings or maybe because it's tied to so many other important systems, you know, potentially, um, it has not gone away. So it'd be interesting to tease apart why it hasn't changed much. Um, I mean, if indeed it hasn't changed much. So that's, that's kind of like the BS answer to your question of, I don't really know, but I'm going to conjecture. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great that. answer. And I mean, if, if you actually uh, come across anything uh, in all your research around sweat regarding this, I will say there's a lot of papers out there showing that in, in the case of humans, at least, it definitely often goes beyond the point of being helpful. Like you mentioned the slippery pencil, you know, that's not just a situation where you don't need a better grip, but this, this sweat is actually giving you a worse grip. So, um, I, I've been reading a lot of papers on this recently. There's an optimal point of hand wetness, basically, where you're going to have the perfect grip. And if you sweat beyond that, uh, it just gets a lot worse. And nobody uh, that I've read has been able to give a good answer as to how that happened, what kind of evolutionary mistake that is that we get so sweaty in our hands sometimes that we have a worse grip. Sure, sure. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are lots of examples of, of evolved human biology that can actually work against us, right? I mean, um, and many of them have to do with the novel environment that we live in. I don't, I'm not sure this really applies to sweating, but I mean, the way that we are metabolically tuned, our bodies really, really want to hang on to fat. 
right? And that's that's a whole really interesting story. By the way, uh, just came out, uh, PBS Nova just came out last night, so April 9th. Um, I think it's called like The Story of Fat or something. Mm-hmm. And anyway, fascinating. It's kind of related to all this stuff. I'm sorry, your question was, uh, why would we sweat more than is helpful? Yeah, have you, have you seen any research or any findings as to how that could have happened for this flight or flight sweat? No, no. I mean, I haven't, but it's not all that surprising because many of our evolved responses and many parts of our evolved physiology can very easily work against us. Um, I would guess that it's just not super finely tuned because it's much better to at some point, it must have been much better to have an over hyper fight or flight response than an underdeveloped fight or flight response, right? So it's like err on the side of caution. I mean, I don't know, like speaking off the cuff here, like think about how nervous most prey animals are, right? Really most animals, period. Like any undomesticated animal uh, is very skittish. So I guess you could say they have a heightened fight or flight response. And that's, and why that's helpful is, is obvious. I mean, um, it's much better to, to overreact and run than it is to underreact and get eaten. So apparently we still have that. And because there's so much diversity across humans and all kinds of traits, it makes sense then that there would also be diversity in, you know, the power of our fight, of our uh, fight or flight response, like anxiety, um, and in how that plays out, for example, sweating, you know, things like that. So I don't think it's a good answer to your question. I'm just saying, I think it makes sense that we have this variation and that's just another example of a trait that while it was initially helpful can easily become unhelpful um and i think it actually makes sense in in light of, of you know how evolution works so over time humans evolved uh to have a greater sweat gland density that led to people sweating more um and today you know, what we're, what you're looking at is one, that sweat gland density, but then two, also the rate of sweat that's coming out of each individual gland itself, because it's not like, like you said, you sweat more than most and you have the lowest sweat gland density. So those are two of the things that you're looking at. Um, to summarize, like what are the big open-ended questions? You mentioned three things, three questions that you're answering right now. What are those and how are you tackling them? Right. Thank you for making me be more concise. That's great. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> All right. So number one, so basically we want to know um, what is some of the variation across humans in how many sweat glands we have? What's the difference between you, me, me and Susan, whatever. Okay. Um, what is the diversity? And some other studies have looked at that. We're going to add to that. Number two, what causes that? To, what, what explains that diversity? Is it, um, is it where your ancestors come from, right? So are there evolutionary differences based on where your recent ancestors have spent the last couple thousand years or whatever, right? Um, or, and or, is it explained by phenotypic plasticity? So is it explained by where you grew up? So regardless of your genetic or geographic ancestral background, where you spent early childhood, does that explain how many sweat glands you have? Um, and of course, we have to consider all kinds of other things like how much skin you have, body surface area, how active you are. Um, we're looking at all the climate, some of the main climate variables from, the, from where your ancestors spent time and where you grew up. Um, and our third question, and I think maybe the most interesting, uh, is does sweat gland density matter? Like this uh, variation between humans, does it matter? Um, density across species certainly matters. I mean, those of us humans, right? Humans, who, humans can sweat more because we have more sweat glands and we can cool better. But the variation we see in people, do people with more sweat glands actually cool off better or not? So wh- wh- why do you think that uh, you're one of the sweatiest people you know? I mean, maybe not one of the sweatiest people I know, but we, so we've been, we've been roughly measuring sweat output in two ways. So for the 70 something people that I've tested so far, just counting their sweat glands. Um, we also tape gauze to each area to get a rough measure of how much sweat they are, they are making. So we weigh the gauze before and after it's not perfect, but it gives us a good idea. And I'm in the top five, I think out of the 70 people we've tested. Now, part of that is the time of year and I haven't accounted for that yet. So anyone you test in the summer is going to make more sweat than testing that same person in the winter. And I tested myself in the summer. So take that with a grain of salt. Is that true? Even if the room is at the same temperature? (laughs) 
Yeah. Why is that? What? I'm sorry. Why, why is that? If the room's at the same temperature, why would somebody sweat more in the summer than in the winter? Um, so every year, so basically you can, your, your current heat acclimation changes uh, based on how much, based, based on how hot you're getting. So it could be winter, but if you go do hot yoga or you exercise a lot, so you're making a lot of internal heat, right? Um, then your body basically gets better at cooling off. And for most people, the first response is let's start to sweat more, right? So the things that happen in your body during the summer or when you're exercising a lot are your body's basically saying this idiot is going to keep getting hot and it's hot outside and it's really hard to cool when the air outside your body is as hot as your body, right? So sweating is the only way to do it in that case, really. Um, so you start to sweat more and you sweat earlier. Uh, your sweat output per gland increases. Your sweat glands themselves get bigger, just like a muscle. And that's how they make more sweat. So there's some evidence they can grow two to three times in size. So why summer? Well, uh, most people are outside in the summer. They're getting hotter. And so their sweat output increases. And then if you stop keeping yourself hot, then by winter, your sweat output decreases. Awesome. So uh, going forward, you know, a couple hundred thousand years, do you have any crazy ideas, conjectures about how sweat glands will evolve over time moving forward? I, I was asked this question yesterday and it surprised me, but I'm not surprised now. But I'm going <laughs> to give you the same response, I think. So we are still evolving, right? Um, but we are no longer evolving in the same way that we used to, in the same way that most animals do, and that we're no longer out there clawing for survival. We have tons of calories. Um, so when you think about how evolution works, any genes that help their owners to have more offspring, those genes become more common. So if we want to know how sweat gland biology will change due to evolutionary forces in the next few thousand years or whatever, we'd have to ask, okay, um, does, does the genetics of your sweating biology actually impact how many offspring you have? Mm. So, and I think it's probably hard to imagine that that matters very much at all. So the things that matter now really are like your immune function, right? Um, and really like your social and cultural skill, I guess. I mean, if you can, I don't want to be crass about this culture is very complicated, but if you can convince someone that you're good enough to mate with, then whatever genes you have are getting passed on. And it's hard to imagine that sweating has very much to do with that. So with the exception of people living in really marginal environments where, I don't know, maybe having a, having a uh, sweating disorder means you can't cool and therefore you're sick and don't reproduce. Or interestingly, um, places without fresh water maybe. Um, if you're, one thing we haven't talked about, sweating leads to dehydration, right? Big time. Wow. So if you, if you can't replenish what you're sweating, then we could, we could say, okay, well, those, those people who sweat, I don't know, too much in a place without good water, maybe they're going to be a little sicker and they're not going to have as many offspring. But I think for the most part, any changes we see in most aspects of uh, human biology are going to be due to sort of unforeseen and random evolutionary forces. Um, so it's really, it's really difficult to imagine what we're, what we're going to look like. This that's, has been that's so much fun. I just want to, I want to ask real quick, um, is there, what's the most interesting question we forgot to ask you about sweating? Oh gosh. I mean, I really, I really think you hit them. I've had my nose down in this for so long that like, I forgot some of the other interesting questions. So thanks for reminding me, but um, gosh, really nothing comes to mind. I mean, all the questions we just talked about are still so unresolved. There's, here's the most interesting thing. I think this is only kind of answering your question. When I went back to school to become a scientist, I had no idea. So like I imagine science as being this, um, this huge endeavor that millions of people are partaking in. And we've answered 90% of the questions that are out there. And we understand so much about the world. We don't even understand um, why we have how many sweat glands we have. Yeah. Like this, it's this super basic piece of how we evolved. It's one of like the five hallmarks of human evolution. Sweating was one of the five, I think, right? And so for me, the takeaway is there is so much left to learn. Uh, we do not have it all together. We've got so much left to investigate and there's space for anyone who's curious and has some years to devote to it, get in here and answer some questions about human evolution because there's a lot of them. Well, that's, 
that's an awesome call to arms. If anybody who's listening to this is interesting and interested in learning more, wants to discover more about sweating, we need you. Yeah, you know, uh, Drew needs you out there. So we're gonna link to his paper in the show notes that we've been referencing. We'll link to some of the stuff that you mentioned, the um, the David Attenborough about uh, you know hunting through running, uh, the talk that you gave about sweating a month ago. Uh, so you can see that all in the in the links attached to this description. Um, but Drew, thank you so, so much thank for you. joining us. This has been a fascinating episode. This has been very fun. Thank you, guys. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day. And as for our listeners, we will see you next week on Let's Talk About Sweat. Sweat.